Thanks a lot for the invitation uh, from Dennis and Osvaldo to present here. It's really a pleasure and honor uh, to be in such a lovely part of London. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to tell you a tale of quantum data processing and recovery. This is a joint collaboration um, between myself and uh, these, these researchers here, Marius Junga, Renato Renner, David Suter, and Andreas Winter but also several others. So I'm going to give you a little motivation first. We're, we're looking at uh, fundamental quantum entropy inequalities that play a critical role in quantum information theory. Um, many of these were established in the 1970s, quite some time ago. Um, the, the, the difficulty in establishing them is that we're dealing with non-commutativity in the quantum case, so I'll get to that a bit later. Um, of course, we have classical information inequalities that have been around, I think, even before this. Their applications are in determining limits for quantum communication channels, but also we can relate them uh, to physics, to areas of physics of interest, including thermodynamics, relations to the second law of thermodynamics, also the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There are entropic versions of those that have, been, that have come about and even relations to the, the process of attempting to clone. So in quantum mechanics, you're not allowed to copy quantum states. That's this famous theorem. And uh, you can try to do so approximately. OK. The, the main one that I'm going to talk about is the data processing inequality for quantum relative entropy. There's another one called strong subadditivity, which is related to that. And that's actually just the non-negativity of quantum conditional mutual information. That's something that's perhaps trivial in classical information theory, but it's highly non-trivial in the quantum case. Um, these, these entropy inequalities are equivalent to each other, so we can describe them as constituting some fundamental law of quantum information. What I'm going to tell you about, hopefully there's enough time, about uh, developments that have happened in the past few years about refining these entropy inequalities in a physically meaningful sense. OK, so let's jump right into it. What are quantum states? I'm going to give you some, some background. Um, a quantum system, the state of it is described by a density operator, which is a positive semi-definite matrix with trace equal to 1. That generalizes, you can think of it as a generalization of a probability, di probability distribution. So this would be the quantum state of a qubit, the simplest possible quantum physical system. Uh, classical bit, we would just put the, the probability values along the diagonal. And so in this sense, uh, quantum is, uh, captures what you can do classically, but it's somehow richer because you can have these off-diagonal, what are called coherences. Okay. What is a quantum channel? This is another basic object that we need. Um, so any physical, any quantum physical process can be described by a quantum channel. And uh, mathematically, what, what do we require? It should take a quantum state, it should evolve a quantum state to a quantum state, OK? So um, it's natural to place a constraint that it should be linear. Um, a positive map is a map that takes positive sem semi-definite matrices to positive semi-definite matrices. But what we require is this notion of complete positivity, so if the channel is acting on one share, maybe there would be another sh quantum system over here that could be entangled with this one. So in that case, the, the channel should output a legitimate quantum state, and that's the requirement of complete positivity. So it's just, if it's just acting on one share of a quantum state. And it should be trace preserving. And so you can think of that as uh, probability conserving. OK. And a channel of interest that comes up quite a bit as a quantum measurement, but we can really think of that as a channel that takes a quantum system to a classical system. And when I say classical system, I mean one that is just uh, the elements are, the, the, the non-zero elements are along the diagonal. Also, what's an interesting notion, um, I don't know if it's really thought about in the classical sense, is this notion of the extension of a quantum channel. Okay, so this is called isometric extension. And to every quantum channel, you can find an isometric or unitary map um, such that the system that's sent through, it gets mapped to 
a system, a quantum system for Bob and a quantum system that's inaccessible, it's in the environment, it's somehow lost, and you recover the original quantum channel by a trace over the environment. Okay. So these are, those are some of the basic objects we deal with. Um, there are a variety of ways that you could generalize the notion of classical relative entropy to the quantum case. In fact, there's an infinite number of ways you can do so uh, because of this non-commutativity. But the one that has been settled uh, as the one to, to look at is this definition. So it's just the, if you have two density operators, rho and sigma, it's given by this formula here. Okay, and if you plug in diagonal states corresponding to classical probability distributions, you recover the classical relative entropy. So this is a fundamental measure of dissimilarity to consider, and from this measure we can derive many other entropy measures like entropy itself, mutual information, conditional entropy. So there's been a lot of focus uh, in studying this quantity. What is its meaning? There's a quantum version of the Stein's lemma. Um, so in, in the statistical sense, in, in hypothesis testing, so it corresponds to, you should think of this operational picture here. There's an experiment, either n copies of the state rho have been chosen or n copies of the state sigma, and you're given these n copies and your task is to determine which state was prepared. The, the only way that you can do so is to perform a quantum measurement, and mo more, most generally you want to perform a collective quantum measurement on all of the systems, and you have to decide whether the state prepared was rho tensor n or sigma tensor n. So if you make a constraint on the type one error probability, like a, a constant error constraint, and you're interested, interested in the type two error exponent, uh, he, I, and Petz proved in 1991 um, that, that that optimal error exponent is given by the quantum relative entropy. And so that generalizes the classical Stein lemma uh, from, from Stein and Chernoff. Okay. Um, another entrop entropy inequality, another, so one of the core statements of interest is something that I mentioned earlier is the data processing inequality for quantum relative entropy. And it's just the statement that under the action of a quantum channel, the states, uh, don't, you know, the, the, the distinguishability does not in, increase under the action of a quantum channel. And um, this entropy inequality was proved by Lindblad in 1975, so it's this fundamental result. And uh, again, the difficulty in proving this is that the states are non-commuting, okay? And Ullmann had some uh, generalization of that result to uh, states of von Neumann algebras. Okay. Um, how do you prove that theorem? There are a variety of ways, uh, one of which is to, prove, to, to invoke the strong subadditivity of quantum entropy. So this is the non-negativity of conditional mutual information. This was proved by Elliot Lieb and Mary Beth Raskai in 1973, and there are a variety of other methods. Okay, and one thing that I think is very interesting that Mary Beth Raskai identified is that there's a sense in which several entropy inequalities are equivalent to each other. So we call this the circle of equivalences. And you can prove that strong subadditivity implies concavity of conditional entropy, which is somehow non-trivial. Uh, that implies the monotonicity of relative entropy under a simple quantum channel partial trace, which is just discarding one share of a quantum system. Also, this notion of joint convexity is part of the circle, and then monotonicity of relative entropy. Okay, so in 1986, Dennis Petz asked an interesting question. When does equality hold in the, in the entropy inequality, the data processing for relative entropy? Okay, and so we're interested in this question, and he proved that uh, equality holds if and only if there exists a recovery channel from which if you perform this recovery channel on the noisy version of the sigma state, you recover back the sigma state. And if you perform it on the noisy version of the, the rho state, you recover back the rho state. So it's related to sufficiency, which is a topic that came up yesterday. Um, and furthermore, Petz gave an explicit form for this channel. Um, and it looks like this, you know, maybe that looks really crazy, right? Um, but um, 
this is indeed a quantum channel, okay? So this is a completely positive trace-preserving map, and we're gonna look at the classical version of this map on the next slide. It'll actually be something familiar. But something I wanna point out, there's a simple calculation we can do to verify this equation. Um, so this equation always holds when we choose the PETS recovery channel in this way. If you plug in N of sigma here, this collapses to the identity, and this right here is what's called the adjoint of a quantum channel. It's the adjoint with respect to the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product. It's, it's a known thing if the adjoint acts on the identity, you get back the identity, and then the sigma one-half collapses. Okay, so this, so that, you know, you kind of see that pretty quickly, and the non-trivial part is that if the equality holds, then the PETS recovery channel recovers back rho as well. Okay, so, ah, I should have played a game. <laughs> for you to guess what is the, the classical version of this, but now maybe some of you saw it quickly. It's really just the Bayes theorem. What do you get from the Bayes theorem? So that's very interesting. If rho and sigma are instead diagonal states uh, and probability distributions P and Q, and you have a classical channel, then the PETS recovery channel is just the map that you get from the Bayes theorem. Okay, and so, and, and so that's an interesting special case. Okay, so we're progressing quite rapidly through the years. In 2012, um, Kay Lee and Andreas Winter asked about what if, the, what if the equality in the monotonicity holds approximately? What can we say in that case? And the question is, the question they posed is, does there exist a recovery channel um, that still recovers the sigma state perfectly from the noisy version of the sigma state while recovering rho approximately from the noisy version of the, the rho state. Okay, so they had some conjectures, very interesting. I think they effectively conjectured that the PETS recovery channel could do this approximately. Um, and what they proved was a classical statement, which I don't, I actually don't know if this was asked in the classical case. Maybe some of the experts could inform me and others about this, but what they proved is that you can have this lower bound on the monotonicity of relative entropy given by a relative entropy itself from the, what is the rho state or the p probability distribution to the recovered version of the p probability distribution, okay? So that's an interesting entropy inequality. Um, and so what remained was to consider this for the quantum case, okay? How am I doing on time? Five minutes, all right, we gotta go super fast. So, a measure of approximation, six minutes, excellent, um, is the fidelity, and you can think of this as the quantum version of the Bhattacharya distance, but the Bhattacharya overlap, okay? But it's the non-commutative version, and it's, it's a measure of similarity. So I, I wanted to tell some story of how this refinement developed. Um, some of us were attending, not so far away, in 2013, a workshop, Mathematical Challenges in Quantum Information at the University of Cambridge, and we started talking about, uh, Andreas started telling us about his conjecture in the classical results. And then a few months later, Mario Berta, who's nearby at Imperial College London, and uh, Kaushik, who is a student at LSU, we started thinking about this, and we published a paper about this funny notion of a, a Renyi generalization of a relative entropy difference. That's quite a mouthful. Um, but I'll tell you a bit about that. So what we did was, we had our reasons, we constructed this funny monster Renyi quantity, okay? So what's embedded in this, in this funny quantity are all the objects of interest uh, for the, the desired entropy inequality. So we have rho, we have sigma, we have the isometric extension of the channel, we have the noisy versions of the state also. Okay, so that was a very funny thing. But what we noticed is that in the limit, as alpha goes to one, you, you do some calculus, and matrix calculus, I guess, and this converges to the, the difference of relative entropies. Okay, so that's one thing of interest in the entropy inequality. The other thing that we noticed, which was quite remarkable, is that in the limit, as alpha goes to a half, it converged to something that could be an interesting lower bound, so it's the fidelity of rho to the recovered version of rho, okay? And one thing we know about Renyi entropies is that they're ordered, okay? So some thought that we had is that, gee, if this quantity was ordered like the Renyi entropies, then we would have it. We haven't been able to prove that, so what we did was we, we tried some other things. So then, a bit after that, uh, my wife and I took a, a lovely trip to Delft, Netherlands, visited the group of Stephanie Vayner, 
And then one of the evenings, I was reading a paper of Frederick Dupuy on chain rules for quantum Renyi entropies. And he was using this, this interesting method of complex interpolation. Okay? And while reading this paper, I got uh, very excited. And then I realized, gee, we could put that together and solve the, give a solution to the problem. So of course, I was very excited about this. I stayed up all night. Woke up my wife at like 6 a.m. She was like, please tell me about the theorem in three hours. And um, anyway, so I was very excited. I wrote up a paper that day, posted it to the archive. And um, it was an exhilarating experience as a scientist. So what is the main result? It's this entropy inequality here. So um, rem remember the classical result. We had the relative entropy of rho to the, the pets recovered version of the noisy row. Okay, so this is serving as some kind of replacement for that in the quantum case. Okay? And what we have is we don't have the pets recovery map itself, but we have uh, a rotated pets recovery. So first you do a unitary rotation, which is a legitimate quantum channel, then you do the pets recovery, then you do another unitary rotation. Okay? And this has all the desired properties. You get a lower bound such that if this difference is small, then rho will be close to the recovered version of rho. And furthermore, this, this recovery map will perfectly recover sigma from the noisy version of sigma. OK. How am I doing now? <laughs> all right. Um, so I will skip notions of the proof, but you use ideas from complex analysis, in particular this uh, complex interpolation theorem. If you've taken complex analysis, there's this maximum modulus principle that you learn about, how a holomorphic function takes its maximum value on the boundary of a region. And using some extension of that uh, for the strip in the complex plane, uh, you, you get this result. OK, so ba ba ba, that's the proof. What I want to, maybe just one more thing to say is um, I discussed this paper with others and I was realized there was still something left to, to think about. You might have noticed if you're looking carefully, there was a supremum over this parameter. And so that meant that the recovery map depends on the, the row state. And so it's somehow desirable for applications for it not to, pen, to depend on the row state. So, what I did was I, I visited uh, from Delft, uh, we went to, Zurich. We talked to David Suter, Renato Renner. From there, we went to Barcelona, talked to Andreas Winter. We had some partial results. And then I went to Urbana Champagne in good old mid America. And um, Marius Young had talked, and I talked for a while. And then I was given a seminar. It was literally the last slide of the last minute of the last hour of the last day of the visit. And Marius said, Hey, there's this theorem from uh, complex analysis, maybe, maybe we should look at. And he had a very good idea. And it was quite fortunate that he was present. Uh, he's a very strong mathematician there who's interested in quantum information. So then we realized the theorem to use was this stein hirschman theorem from complex interpolation. OK, and so the refined statement was this. Now we have this uh, convex combination of PETS recovery channels. And this, this recovery, this, this distribution has no dependence on the row state, okay? So that, that solved the open problem that we were very interested in. And uh, this is one statement we have. And then if you use the concavity of log and concavity of the fidelity, then you literally get the, the universal recovery channel. So that's all I really had to say. Um, i running out of time. Let me just give some conclusions. Um, what's nice about these, these um, recent refinements is that they're, they're physically meaningful. They've been used for applications not only in quantum information, but people at high energy physics are using it to understand quantum theories of gravity, which is a rather exotic application. Um, and uh, in some sense, the proof is brief, you know, depending on powerful theorems and complex analysis that might find further applications in quantum information. Um, and then in other papers, we, we explored how this theorem, for example, can give a refinement of the entropic uncertainty relation. And also, it has applications to quantum Gaussian channels.
So I'll leave an open question that it's still, you know, the, the, the theorem I presented might be considered complicated, right? There's all these symbols floating around. There's a question of whether the recovery channel could be taken to be the PET's recovery channel itself. That would make things a lot simpler. There are some special situations in which that can happen, but no one has proved that uh, generally. Thanks a lot.